Hi, y'all. Let's talk a little bit about the Department of Justice's IG report on the Clinton investigation, the email investigation. Uh, so you don't have to waste your time doing it. I've read all 500 whatever pages of the report, a real page turner. I've listened to all of the uh, congressional testimony. Very interesting. I highly recommend reading the IG report. Uh, it is beautiful prose, a perfect rend a perfect rendition of uh, bureaucraties. So if ever you run out of sleeping pills, this will help. Trust me. So anyway, before I get into some of the issues I have with the actual report, which apparently um, I'm unique in having, but we'll get to that later, I want to first um, go back to independent councils. We used to have independent councils, but that statute was uh, permitted to sunset uh, primar primarily because of the mischief that independent councils created. Namely, in that once a person was created as an independent council, they were, as the name suggests, independent of supervision by the department. Uh, they set their own work, they set their own business, and pursued what uh, such matters as to them seemed uh, like a really productive use of their time. And that's how you got from Bill Clinton's uh, real estate deals to, some, to semen on a blue dress. It's just uh, the, in, in, uh, the, un, the inability of, special, of I'm sorry, independent councils to stick with their original scope. The, those matters uh, that, are, that are, were brought before them, that got them uh, created as an independent council, and other similar type things. They just went and did whatever they want. So that was really problematic. On the other side of that, you can get a, you can get a person who wants to narrow the scope to ignore things that are just like what it is you were originally created uh, to be originally ch uh, tasked with investigating. And that's an interesting switch here, and this is happening in the FBI and DOJ with respect to this. I'll get to it in a minute. Um, and it, th these issues that I'm going to address weren't really hit by anybody. I mean, they got in the periphery of it, but they seem to be making some very fundamental um, errors in, in reasoning, and it, it's baffling. So I'm going to read a little bit from the IG's, uh, the IG's report, very interesting again, uh, to kind of go over some highlights of the issues that I want to address. Uh, so um, we analyze the department's declination decision according to the same analytical standard that we applied to other investigations made during the investigation. We did not substitute the OIG's judgment for the judgments made by the department but rather sought to, de to determine whether the decision was based on improper considerations, including political bias. We found no evidence that the conclusions by the prosecutors were affected by bias or other improper considerations. Rather, we determined they were based on the prosecutor's assessment of the facts, the law, and past department practice. Uh, you're going to hear this a lot. Um, this was a judgment call on behalf of prosecutors and agents. This was a judgment call. This was a judgment call. Uh, we did not find any evidence uh, for that that says it directly affected uh, some some particular matter. If you go listen to the congressional testimony, the IG is very careful uh, when he responds to questions about um, what effect, if any, some bias that is conceitedly in the investigation had on the ultimate decision. And he would say uh, the bias, such as it existed, did not directly affect the outcome with respect to the questions we addressed. And of course, uh, they didn't address all the questions, they only addressed a, a proper subset of the questions. And the reason for this is that it wouldn't be possible to look at every decision made in the investigation, which is of, of course true, so they chose only a handful of decisions that were made and, uh, and then pursued those. Now when they say there's no direct evidence, what the IG is literally saying is, we were unable to find a document that said I, special agent in charge of the investigation on the Hillary Clinton email matters, comma, uh, in my official capacity, comma, am for politically biased reasons or other improper considerations going to make this decision which will, uh, which will affect the outcome of the investigation in some kind of way. They didn't find a document like that. Uh, no one walked in twirling his mustache and confessing to something along those lines. So that's what they mean when, when they say there's no evidence. Uh, that it was that it directly affected it for some reason circumstantial evidence is insufficient here Even though that's typically how you go about determining these things in the real world It's through, because rarely do criminals you know write out a little you know dear diary today uh, You know I looked up the law and I found 18 USC something really terrible dash whatever And I've decided I'm going to violate this statute by taking the following actions one You know whatever it is two whatever it is three whatever it is uh, sincerely uh, Stupid fucking criminal, you know, love stupid fucking criminal. That just does not happen. So you have to find out these things through circumstantial evidence. Look at um, 
what has in fact happened. And anyway, so those types of things. <clears throat> But just, just to be clear here, when they say did not directly affect the, the decision, that is what they mean, is that there was not a document where anyone wrote down that they were making this particular decision for uh, an improper reason uh, in order to benefit a party or to save someone, to you know, save someone embarrassment, whatever it is. So that, that's all that it means. Uh, so it goes on, and uh, I'm now in chapter 5, uh, I think. We question why the, uh, the I'm sorry the Midyear team did not serve subpoenas on or seek to obtain search warrants related to the last known persons to possess devices that the team was never able to locate. These included Combetta for the missing uh, laptop and Clinton or her attorneys for Clinton's handheld devices. Both FBI and department witnesses told us they believed Combetta and Clinton's attorneys were being truthful that they could not locate these devices and therefore subpoenas would not have made. A difference in these situations. This was a judgment call made by the prosecutors and agents, and we did not we did not identify evidence that it was infected by bias or improper considerations. Okay, so this is essentially uh, you know um, the events in the world four times you know, to the, you know four times removed. This report is saying that the IG believed that the prosecutors and the agents with whom they spoke believed that the lawyers for the defendant, or the uh, target of the investigation with whom they spoke, believed that the, that the client was unable to locate something. Because, you know, attorneys don't go searching their own clients' homes to, to find evidence uh, that may not be advantageous to the client, unless they have a legal obligation to do it. So that's what you're getting here. Uh, Frank told me that Susan told him that Mark told him that uh, Sally was a really good person. So, you know, that's my conclusion. I haven't no reason to dispute it, particularly given all the things I'm going to ignore. Um, so that was a, a judgment call made by prosecutors and agents, and uh, was not did not identify evidence that it was infected by bias or improper considerations. Uh, let's get to the next part. Decisions not to obtain or seek to review certain evidence. The mid-year team did not obtain or review some evidence. Oh, let me go back for just a second. The previous bit I was talking about... Uh, the Midyear team did not serve subpoenas or seek to obtain search warrants, but the Inspector General responded only to the subpoena point um, uh, that Clinton, the attorneys, or whatever, were being truthful that they could not locate these devices and therefore subpoenas would not have made a difference in these situations. I fully agree. If a person tells you I can't find it, and you know, even if they're lying, the the uh, you know, the problem there is that whether they're telling the truth or whether they're lying, you're not going to get the device unless you do something. And uh, you know, issuing a subpoena, maybe they'll change their mind if they're lying, uh, or maybe they won't. That's why we don't rely on defendant, uh, sorry, targets of investigations or criminal defendants to be the only person who gets to decide what it is we're going to go seek to find. That's why we have search warrants. A search warrant is not a request; it's compulsory process. The you know the law enforcement agents show up to the wherever it is that is going to be searched, and they conduct the search. They don't stand outside and go, "We've got a warrant. Go in there and find it and bring it to us if you can." Uh, but here the IG says, "Well, because the prosecutor told us uh, that the lawyer told us that I'm sorry that the lawyer told them that the client told them we're going to take that at face value, uh, and that's all good and wonderful." No, uh, so the IG left out talking about the search warrant and uh, def you know, spoke about not getting a subpoena. A very interesting um, failure to address the entire point. Anyway, the Midyear team did not obtain or review some evidence that we found might have been useful to the investigation. The team's reasons for not doing so appear to have been based on limitations they imposed on the scope of their investigation, the desire to complete the investigation well before the election, and their belief that the foregone evidence was likely of limited value. We found no evidence that the decisions not to obtain this evidence were based on improper considerations or bias. We concluded that these were judgment calls made by the prosecutors and agents. So, remember the scope issue I mentioned earlier. Independent counsels, once they're created, are unable, seemingly, to uh, confine their work to the matters, the types of matters for which they were created. Here, you're given a certain scope, a certain category of matters, and they've decided not to invest. This is the FBI, DOJ, not the IG. They've decided not to investigate all of the matters that fall within that scope. Um, 
so uh, limitations they imposed on the scope of their investigation, which actually is not an imposition on the scope of the investigation. This is a, a confusion in reasoning. It is a, uh, a limitation they imposed on the scale of their investigation. The scope deals with the subject matter. The scale deals with the, how large the investigation will be. Now, uh, one of the uh, things they said, they said here, the desire to complete the investigation well before the election. I have worked hundreds of criminal investigations, and the only time deadline I have ever remotely been interested in is uh, one that is imposed by statute, namely the statute of limitations. That's the only timeline that I'm up against, because I have to complete, an investigator has to complete the work before uh, the statute of limitations runs, or else you can't bring the prosecution. Um, so here, they have arbitrarily chosen the election, and have said, we want to terminate our work before the election. This is a political decision for when to terminate the investigation. Somehow or other, this doesn't get recognized. Now, another issue with the independent, uh, I'm sorry, with the IG, is he is conflating that the prosecutors who made the decision did not cause the bias that affected the decision, but were ne the decision was nevertheless affected by the bias. He's confusing the who with, with the, the reason, um, and it's, it baffles me. So we found that the FBI team and the prosecutors decided together to generally limit the devices they sought to those that either belonged to Clinton or were used to back up or call, uh, call Clinton's emails. The team provided, among others, the following reasons for placing this limitation on the scope of the investigation. The culture of mishandling classified information in the State Department, which made the quantity of potential sources of evidence particularly vast. So this is the size. I've never worked an investigation of, on, on a given matter, like, I don't know, maybe a, working a kidnapping or something. Uh, and you say, well, the, the likeliest people to have kidnapped a person who's gone missing is a family member or a friend or acquaintance. So we'll start there. Those are the likeliest culprits. We'll start there and work out. Uh, it would be no like reason to abandon the investigation, go back and go, well, you know, he lived with a whole bunch of other people who've done kidnapping too, so uh, it was just, there would have been too many people to investigate, too many questions to ask, it just, it was, it was hard work. You know, look, sometimes you might have to beat down 500 doors doing a Canvas interview to get that one piece of information you require. When the likeliest places where you expect to find it don't turn it up, you have to go further afield to continue pursuing all of the relevant bits of, of the case, which they chose not to do. Why did they choose not to do it? Precisely because they had artificially imposed a stop time on the investigation for a political purpose. So, uh, two, the belief that Clinton's own devices and the laptops used to call her emails were the most likely places to find the complete collection of emails from her tenure as Secretary of State. And three, the belief that the State Department was the better entity to conduct a spill investigation. This is laughable. Reason number one is that the State Department has such a, such a problem of mishandling um, you know, classified information. It's just so rampant that the, the, the scope, the scale of the investigation would be too large for the Federal Bureau of Investigations to even do. Uh, they just couldn't handle it uh, you know, within a given time frame. But nevertheless, uh, it's the, the, the climate, the command culture that led to this state of affairs where people think they can just mishandle classified information all they want is nevertheless fully capable of being the people to conduct the internal investigation to solve the problem that their lack of leadership has in the first place caused. Did it ever occur to the prosecutors and to the FBI agents that just perhaps the reason you have such a rampant problem of mishandling of classified information is the, uh, the lack of prosecutions for people who are mishandling classified information. You get one every once in, every once in a while. Once in a blue moon, such a prosecution will show up, and there will be, you know, there'll be a, tr a, well, a prosecution. Um, so people know that they're not, there's not a great deal on the line. They'll get counseled for it, probably, if, if anything. But anyway, so the, department, uh, the State Department was the better entity to conduct the spill investigation, even though the State Department, you know, the same one, that has such an incompetent leadership chain that it, it doesn't even bother to enforce its internal regulations, let alone the law, on the handling of classified information. Now, when the decision from uh, Comey was announced, saying that no reasonable prosecutor on those facts would prosecute Hillary Clinton, I agreed with him at the time. 
And some people got up my ass saying, well, you haven't seen all the evidence. Well, of course I haven't seen all the evidence. The FBI is not disclosing it. They're kind of notorious for not doing that kind of shit. So, uh, yo, you're just taking it on faith. I am making a judgment based on what people have seen the evidence, whom I consider to be reasonably honest, are telling me about it. Uh, and what Comey said, based on the evidence that was collected, it's true. Uh, I still stand by you know, what I said a, a year, well, two years ago, I guess it was now, whatever, uh, however long ago it was, that based on those facts uh, and you know, the law, I, don't, I did not see a conviction in the offing. And if, and if a prosecutor is not convinced that he can persuade a jury beyond a reasonable doubt, then you don't prosecute the case. Uh, you, have to be, you, have to have, you have to be persuaded that you have a good chance of prevailing in court before you bring the prosecution. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time and money when you don't believe that you can win your case. Anyway, uh, uh, so at the time I thought that it was the right decision the prosecutors made, uh, I think that now, uh, based on the facts that were available to them. Now, notice that a lot of these things end with him saying, you know, based on the facts, the law, the precedent, a judgment call, those types of things. All right. Uh, with respect to the first rationale, we note that it fails to acknowledge that the team was not required to take an all-or-nothing approach. Yeah, that, that says just about the least of it. They, have, they are investigating the mishandling of classified information, and then in the course of that investigation, they discover the State Department has a rampant problem with that. I would think that an ordinary investigator, an ordinary agent would say, my word, we need a lot more personnel because this case, uh, the scale of it, has just ratcheted up tremendously. It's all within the same scope of, of matters. It's all the same kind of thing. It's just a lot more people are doing it. You, you, you know, the FBI doesn't do this. No federal agency does this. If they're investigating, I don't know, a drug organization, they don't say, aha, look, we, we caught the street, the street dealer and uh, then we didn't bother to go after anybody else because we realized we had such a drug problem uh, that we had to let him go. You know, because if... What, 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 are we, what are we going to do? Go investigate all of them? Oh my God, do you know how much work that is? Yes, that's your job. But, you know, you've imposed for political reasons a, stop, a time to have the investigation completed. So they weren't lacking resources, they weren't lacking time, they weren't lacking anything, except they, for uh, reasons that they did not write out, you know, uh, decided that uh, they would make a decision based on the, the, the politics of the day. What political events are happening in the world, that's what we're going to base our investigative practice on, uh, instead of just, we're going to follow the facts and the evidence wherever it goes. So anyway, uh, for example, a middle ground uh, existed where those devices belonging to Clinton's top three aides, I'm sorry, three top aides, which the team determined accounted for approximately 68% of Clinton's email exchanges, would have been reviewed, but devices belonging to other state department employees would not. Um, I, I would look at all of them. Uh, every investigation I've run, it, okay, look, um, every, well, every investigation I've run, you stop when you have collected the, you know, all, all the evidence. You don't stop before then, because your, your case is not complete until you have, you know, you've exhausted all of your leads, which they did not do. In fact, apparently, there's an entire department of leads that they decided to just ignore and let someone else handle it, you know, the people who can't discipline their own people in the first place. You, you, it, it's like um, writing a story. When, when is the story supposed to end? When it's finished. Not you know, some random point along the way. Um, so anyway, they decided to do that for whatever uh, reason. Now, when I mentioned that the IG was talking about directly affected, the prosecutors who made the ultimate decision, and you know, also agreed with Comey, they don't have to be biased for the decision not to prosecute to nevertheless be biased and directly affected. Um, and by directly, they mean, you know, from here to there in the shortest possible route. Every decision, and if you watch, every decision that's made in an investigation to do something uh, has potentially some impact on the case. So too does every decision not to do something. And if you watch uh, cold case files or you study it at all, you'll quick, quickly realize that one of the reasons that prosecutions don't get brought, the reason the prosecutors say, I don't think there's enough here, is precisely because of things the criminal investigators did not do. Things they chose not to do. Leads they elected not to pursue. Timelines they elected not to get down. 
It isn't because the criminal, by and large, is just oh so crafty and has outsmarted all of law enforcement. It's because the detective or the agent working the case has decided, I'm just not going to do this. I'm not going to do that part. Uh, I don't think there's a big payoff in, in this one extra interview of a, a, a potential witness or this potential, uh, you know, going there to find a potential piece of evidence. Uh, or, you know, sitting down and making a really elaborate chart that shows how everything connects with everything else and, and then walking it through step by step and then throwing all that away and remaking the chart from anew, not from memory, out of my notes. Those types of things to make sure that you haven't overlooked something. And then having uh, your partner uh, do a, a review behind you that was also blind. He did not see your first review, your second review. He's going to do his own independent one. And then you compare at the end. That kind of thing. But, you know, so, if uh, you fail to do something in, in these types of things, and, uh, oh, real quick, one of the Democrat talking points was, oh, it was just a handful of FBI uh, employees who were doing this. First of all, uh, many of them were not FBI employees. They were FBI officers. There's a difference. They were officers of the United States. They require a nomination by the president and, uh, you know, um, uh, con um, in the Senate, oh my God, I've drawn a blank. Advice and consent in the Senate. They, they are officers of the United States, maybe inferior officers, maybe principal officers, but they are officers of the United States. They're not mere employees. These are not, you know, this is not the janitor who did something. It's the number one guy. It's the number two guy. It's the guy who is the uh, guy running the investigation. This is the senior leadership uh, of, of the department in general and this investigation in particular. So anyway, uh, these people, not the, not the director and the deputy uh, uh, director, but the agent running it was one of the people who had this very clear bias against Trump, um, who was, when they're talking in their little uh, strategizing sessions, is going to have ideas. And if the boss says, you know, look, maybe we should narrow the scope because it's going to be really unwieldy and we've, you know, maybe, maybe we should narrow the time, timeline we're going, going to do here. These are decisions of things that we're not going to do. We're not going to allow the investigation to run until its natural completion. We're going to arbitrarily cut it off. We're not going to run down all of these leads because there are so many of them, uh, all of whom, or many of whom, incidentally, we think are actually violating the law or at least regulations, but we're not going to bother with that. These are decisions not to do something. They were consciously made. It, it, uh, they didn't just overlook it. They intentionally set out to narrow uh, how long to restrain how long they're going to work on this matter, to uh, narrow the the uh, types of people they're going to talk to, who are relevant and who may have evidence, because they think it's not as likely the evidence will be found there as it is likely that it'll be found somewhere else. Well, of course, you start with the likeliest places first, but you don't end there. You run down all the possible leads that you can. So their decisions at the outset have constrained, have taken out of the case. Uh, facts that, you know, if found, would have been presented to the prosecutor. So the prosecutors, you don't have to say that they made a biased uh, decision. All you have to say is that the original bias runs through from the beginning to end. It is a direct line from the decisions not to talk to these witnesses, from the decisions not to collect these devices, from the decisions to stop the investigation or at, uh, some arbitrary stopping point in the future based on nothing whatever to do with the case. Uh, that those are the biases that uh, hampered the facts, the, the determining of the facts, the finding of the facts, the collecting of the evidence, on which the prosecutor's decisions ultimately depended. And the OIG's report here is a lot like a prosecutor. The, uh, w when you're getting a, you know, a case taken to the prosecutor, like in the, what happened with the OIG here, you, well, the agents and the officers told me this, that they learned from, the, you know, that's your starting point. That's where the decision is made. It's only after what has been told to the prosecutor and the prosecutor decides there's something here that the prosecutor really gets in it. I can't say only, but usually that's the case. Most uh, decisions are made by law enforcement, uh, practically. They decide, oh, there's nothing here. Um, no need to go on. But if it's something where they you know, have some internal pulse or they have to present to the prosecutors, so they'll present the prosecutors, tell the prosecutor what they think. The prosecutors very often go, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Go away. So that's the kind of uh, situation that, that you have. The, uh, the prosecutors depend upon the initial fact-finding of the investigators. They depend upon the investigators running the investigation through to a natural uh, you know, completion 
they depend on those kinds of things. So when they get a report, they say, okay, the all, the, all that I need for a decision is in this packet here. I will peruse through it and see if what is pre presented in there is sufficient to bring a prosecution. If it is, then I might bring the prosecution. If not, obviously I won't. Uh, so that's the handicap of the pro what happened to the prosecutors. And the IG is confusing the where the bias exists in the case with who is doing it. He's saying that the ultimate decision not to prosecute is uh, a proper decision because the prosecutors based their decision on the facts that were presented to them, the law as it existed, and historical practice within the department. Well, of course, that all that says is that the prosecutors are conscientious. Uh, and, you know, in the regular course of affairs, you can generally trust your investigators to, you know, not suppress evidence from you when they want to bring you a case about a prosecution. You know, they're going to tell you, hey, look, you know, I got all this good stuff for you here. Good stuff, good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. Well, why would you not have all that good stuff? Well, curiously enough, many, many decisions were made, all of which pointed in the same direction. Uh, the, a way to not go about collecting that next piece of information. Now, the circumstantial case I uh, mentioned earlier, normally you find out these types of motives, pretexts as they called it, uh, you know, pretext is where a person's real, the stated motive is not their real motive. How do you determine whether it's a pretext or the state of motive? You look at all the circumstances, and when a whole bunch of decisions are made that invariably point in the same direction, except for maybe a straight one here or there, that tends to undercut the notion that it's not pretextual. Because you, know, you would not think that uh, this decision and this decision and all other decisions would all magically, just by happenstance, find a way to cut the legs out from the ability of the case to collect evidence that would be useful in making a proper determination at the end of the road after it's turned over to the prosecutors for their prosecu uh, prosecutorial decisions. But that was done here. Time after time after time after time after time, a decision was made that limited the capacity of the, the group of people working on this to get the information to collect all of the evidence whether that be not collecting a server, relying on some third party to do the analysis for you and send it over and just take their word for it, uh, just take the word for the lawyer, for the, you know, the person who says, oh, my client couldn't find it, no idea where it is, and oh, sounds good to me. Uh, you know, all these decisions invariably work towards the same end, that there is not going to be a case of, uh, brought out of this at the end of the day. Comey's having written his exoneration letter months before the case was finished. All of these circumstances kind of uh, conspire to the same end, and it's, it's very precarious. But because of the IG's fundamental logical error of saying that because the prosecutor is not the responsible party for the bias that has led to the inability to bring the prosecution, that therefore, uh, and therefore his decision is made in good faith, uh, you know, because if you don't have the facts to bring it, even if someone's tanked the case, you can't bring it, uh, that there wasn't a, a bias that directly affected the decision not to prosecute or to prosecute. It's just not true. There's a direct line from these individual decisions uh, to the ultimate decision not to prosecute that depend upon the, the investigation being narrowed, witnesses intentionally not being interviewed, evidence intentionally not being collected, uh, an artificially imposed time barrier being conjured up for a political purpose, um, you know, the, these types of things. Uh, they didn't think it would be good to have it going on that close to the election. Well, it may not be good to have it going on that close to the election, but once it started, the fact that an election is going to happen uh, can't be the, the uh, you know, it, that can't be the reason of decision for why the case should be brought to an end. If need be, take a break, I suppose, or just keep working and say, well, publish our, you know, we'll finish it when we finish it. Uh, we're not going to stop our investigation simply because an election is happening. I mean, what kind of... What kind of vicissitude for an investigation would that present in the future? Oh, we were going to do this one case, but lo and behold, and there's you know, uh, in two weeks from now there's going to be an election, so we're just not going to bother. It's just bullshit. So uh, the independent counsel thing, unable to stay confined to its scope. Uh, apparently, in the FBI, the DOJ, at least with respect to uh, the Hillary Clinton email thing, unable to to keep the size of the original scope. Because the scale of the the scale of the things that qualify as the same subject matter has gotten large, it, it's you know a weird uh, you know, two sides of the uh, of a coin 
kind of situation. It's just very bizarre. So that's what I have to say on the IG report. Uh, there's a lot more to it, obviously, much of which I agree with. But this peculiar logical problem and the fact that the most obvious conclusion that you can derive from what was written wasn't drawn by the IG. What the IG should have said is the prosecutors acting in good faith were handicapped by the bias that infected it at an earlier, by the bias that infected the investigation at its early stages. So wh whichever prosecutors made the ultimate decision correctly based their judgment on the facts that were given to them. The facts that were given to them were not full and complete precisely because of the biased decisions made by the people conducting the original investigation. That's what tanked the case. And there's no better way to tank a case than to find a way to do all these things that will ultimately lead to some piece of evidence not being collected and then very occasionally saying, well, maybe we should go hard here. Because just saying that occasionally, maybe we should go hard in this one little minor area here. Uh, you know, you say, hey, look, I didn't universally try to narrow it. Look at that. I was really energized at going after that full throttle, but it didn't pan out to be anything. Uh, you know, I, I tried. No, it, it's, it's a smoke and mirrors. Um, so there you have it. Have a great night.